to a mouse by robert burns structure summary analysis hello and welcome to the discourse robert burns was a famous scottish poet who mostly wrote in broad scottish language he is generally considered as the national poet of scotland one of his most famous poem is to a mouse which is based on the themes of nature versus humanity loss and the unpredictable nature of life the poem's full title is to a mouse on turning her up in her nest with the plow and was published in november 1785 the poem depicts a young man who accidentally overturns the soil of a mouse's nest while plowing his field the poem is addressed to a field mouse whose home is suddenly and unintentionally destroyed by the plow driven by the speaker a young farmer in the beginning the speaker literally addresses the mouse but soon the mouse is used as a symbol to represent the natural world especially the elements of nature that are weak innocent or vulnerable to exploitation by humans in addition the mouse is also used as a metaphor to express the plight of the society's weak downtrodden poor people the speaker uses metaphor to compare the mouse's nest to a human house referring to its silly walls and even noting regretfully that the mouse is without a house or hall the mouse is a symbol for all those suffering in the world and can be linked to burns experience of witnessing poor farm hands being turned out of their homes in 1937 american author john steinbeck published his popular novel of mice and men whose title was taken from a line of this poem structure of to a mouse the poem is composed of eight stanzas with six lines in each stanza sets sets burns wrote this poem using a double rhyming pattern feminine rhyme with two unstressed two syllable rhymes one following the other the poem follows a consistent rhyming scheme of a a a b a b the first four lines of each stanza are written in iambic tetrameter while the concluding two lines contain iambic iambic diameter the poet used anthropomorphism in the poem giving human traits to the mouse imagery and symbolism have been used the plow is a symbol of humanity's domination of nature of the rule of the powerful over the powerless the mouse's nest easily and completely destroyed by the plow represents the best laid schemes of mice and men The mouse is a symbol of the poor or powerless downtrodden people of society. In addition, Burns also used the alliteration, allusion, aphorism, antithesis, assonance and consonance. Summary of to a mouse. Stanza 1. We sleek it, cower and timorous beasty, o what a panics in thy breasty. Thou need na start our say hasty, we bickering brattle. I would be laid to rain and chase thee. We murdering pattern. The speaker begins with a reassuring apology, addressing the mouse directly, using the childlike diminutives "basty" and "brasty" while attempting to diffuse its fear. Oh, what a panic! And telling it directly, it is in no danger. Burns used onomatopoeia, bickering brattle, to suggest to the mouse that the trouble he caused. is insignificant and temporary the poet used feminine rhyme to offer more gentleness to the situation the poet says that he knows that the mouse is small and afraid of the presence of humans but the mouse is in no danger the speaker says that the mouse should not fear him it should not start away say hasty or run away so quickly he further says that he does not wish to chase the mouse away or to kill him using a paddle He is not like those of whom the mouse is afraid. He neither wishes to harm the mouse's nest nor wishes to chase it away or kill it. Stanza two: I am truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union, and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. In the next stanza. The speaker continues his polite apology but infuses political philosophy and acumen into it. The speaker is still addressing the mouse but he reflects on nature 
and the impact of human society on nature. Addressing the mouse, he says, I am truly sorry for the human's grateful dominion over nature. Humankind enjoys an unbalanced dominion over the world and has been unwilling to accept creatures that are not like them. The speaker clearly disapproves of the disrupting disruption of harmony in nature, caused here by himself representing humanity. His careless destruction of the nest, showing man's dominion over nature, justifies the mouse's fear of him. Humans are a disruption in the chains of nature, forcing creatures to act as they normally would not. The poet destroyed the nest of the little creature that he knew was critical for the mouse's survival during the winter. Thus, the speaker says that the mouse's fear of humans is genuine. In the next two lines, the poet continues his gentle reassuring approach to address the mouse, calling it an earthborn companion and a fellow mortal. They are one and the same, living at the same time on the same planet. Stanza 3 I doubt na, whilst but thou may thief, what then, poor bestie, thou maun live. A demoniker, in a thrive, some sa request, I will get a blessing with the lave, and never miss it. The speaker continues to apologize and reassure the mouse, requesting it not fear any more. He assures that he does not begrudge the mouse a share of the harvest, although the mouse does thief from him. The speaker accepts that survival is more important than social rules about property. The strong monosyllables in Thou Mon Lip emphasize the absolute need for survival. Robert Burns made a point about redistribution of wealth at this point. The fact that the mouse must steal food from humans does not bother the speaker. It is not the mouse's fault that it has been degraded to this level. The mouse is only a poor bestie which mourn or must live. The speaker says that the mouse often steals daemoniker or an ear of corn. When one steals one daemoniker from a thrave or bundle of twenty-four, it is only a small or small thing. He will give the mouse his blessing through the food it steals. Stanza 4 Thigh wee bit housey, two in room. It's silly, was the winds are strewn. And nothing now to big a new ain. O fog is green, and bleak December's winds and swain, bait snell and keen. In this stanza, the speaker reflects on the consequences his carelessness while using the plough will cause. He addresses the nest of the mouse as housey that, has, that he has ruined. Now when the walls of the mouse's nest or housey are fallen, it does not have the materials to make a new one. It is not the right time of the year to find the green it needs. To, unfortunately, it is going to be December soon. The winds are ensuing or ensuing. Thus the mouse has no option but to brave the winter without the security of its housey. Stanza 5 Thou saw the fields laid barren waste, and weary winter come in fast, and cozy here beneath the blast, thou thought to dwell. Till crash the cruel colter passed, out through thy cell. In this stanza, the speaker expresses his deep empathy towards the mouse. He says that he fully understands the mouse's current situation who tried to shelter in a field where it could cozy beneath the blast. The mouse chose the field to make its nest to avoid the harm of the sharp upcoming winter. It was here it thought to dwell but then crash. The wind came through and destroyed the home it had built. The poet used alliteration, assonance and consonance while choosing the words crash, cruel, coulter to express the harshness of the consequences of his action. Stanza 6 That we bit heap o' leaves and stibble has caused thee money a weary nibble. Now thou's turned out for a thigh trouble, but house or hauled to thole the winter's sleety tribble and canrage called. In this stanza, the poet describes the ruined nest of the mouse that was so humble, and then the speaker describes the ensuing difficulties the mouse will have to face. It was only a wee bit heap o leaves and stibble or pieces of grass and hay. It was made from minimal materials but cost the mouse a lot. All of the work has gone to waste as the wind has turned the mouse out of its home. 
it now has to face the winter's sweetie dribble and crannish or frost. The poet used masculine rhyme in the last two lines of this stanza while using alliteration crannish called to emphasize the misery of the mouse. Stanza 7 But mousey, thou art no thy lane, in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes o' mice and men, gang at gagley, and leave us naught but grief and pain, for promised joy. The speaker continues addressing the mouse while he draws a comparison between the mouse and man, while indicating the uncertain future they both face. The speaker says that the best laid schemes of mice and men fail to give any security at all. Despite the mouse's hard work in building its housey, it is in ruins now, and the mouse has to face the harsh frosty winter. Similarly, the best laid plans of quarters, teen and farmers often fail despite their hard work. Terrible weather, poor harvests, and ever-increasing rents always impose the danger of eviction of the teen and farmer from the field. Often, one's plan go awry, and foresight may often be in vain or pointless when one never knows what is going to happen. John Steenbeck used this line to choose the title of his novel of Mice and Men. Stanza 8 Still thou art blessed, compared with me, the present only toucheth thee, but ouch, I backward cast my e, on prospects dream, and forward though I cannot see, I guess and fear. The speaker continues to compare the situation of the mouse and human beings, though his stress is more over the dilemma of humans now. Rather, the speaker says that the mouse is in a better position. The speaker anxiously considers his own and therefore humanity's view of past, present and future and comments that the mouse is free of such worries. On the other hand, the speaker can backward cast his ear, his prospects appear dear when basing them on what has happened to him previously. Then when he looks forward in time, he cannot see or cannot see the fears that may come for him. The poet ends the poem on this pessimistic note. So this is it for today. We will continue to discuss the history of English literature. Please stay connected with the discourse. Thanks and regards.